Hey, Happy Rant listeners, this is Barnabas Piper. You'll notice this intro sounds a little different than our usual podcast intros. First, because we don't have the screeching video game uh, synthesizer music. And then second of all, because Ted and Ronnie are not on with me. That's because this is a bonus episode that is the audiobook forward and first chapter of my book, The Pastor's Kid. Uh, I wrote this book originally in 2014, and my dad wrote the forward for it. And then in 2020, was able to get it re-released by the Good Book Company and, and record the audiobook for it with one audio. So, and, my, and the coolest thing is that my dad was able to read the forward. So you'll get to hear that in his voice. So um, I guess we can say we have John Piper as a guest on the podcast, although he doesn't know that this is happening. So um, he's, a, he's an unwitting guest. But just a word about the book and who this is for. Um, I wrote this from the perspective of pastor's kids. So trying to write on behalf of, of people like me who have grown up in the church as pastor's kids, dealing with the unique challenges of that, those pressures, that, those expectations, that environment, but then also looking at what is our unique place in the church? What is our hopefulness? What does it look like to find identity in Christ when you've been told your whole life kind of what you're supposed to be? So it's for pastor's kids in that way, but then it's also for church members, how to interact with and encourage the pastor's family. And it's for pastors, whether you, you're uh, aspiring to ministry, you're in ministry, you have young kids, or you, have, you still have kids at home, this is for you. Or if you're a pastor who have, uh, you know, you have kids who have already left, maybe this could open the door to some conversations that you didn't know you needed to have. Um, in the few years it's been out, I've heard some really encouraging stories of how it's helped people. So maybe that's the case for you or somebody you pass this on to. I would love it if you know somebody this could be an encouragement to, you pass it on to them. So what you're about to hear is John Piper reading the foreword to the pastor's kid, and then me reading the first chapter to it. And this is just a gift to you from one audio. The audiobook's available wherever you get those. And then the print book is out there as well. And actually this week, at the time this releases, the ebook is on sale as well. So um, go ahead and grab that if you're interested, or just enjoy the podcast. This is just free for you to enjoy. So here you go. Here's John Piper with way more dulcet tones than me and uh, a lot more good stuff to say than what we normally do on this show. Forward. You will ask, was it painful for me to read this book? The answer is yes, for at least three reasons. First, it exposes sins and weaknesses and imperfections in me. Second, it is not always clear which of its criticisms attach to me and the church I love. Third, this is my son, and he is writing out of his own sorrows. Writing this book has been hard. Maybe it's more accurate to say that a lot of hardship went into writing this book. Some of it in my own family and some of it through the pain of other PKs I connected with along the way. So many PKs carry so much pain and anger and sorrow with them. Some of them have fallen into bitterness, and others are rightly doing the hard work of trust in Jesus to help them through. I am overwhelmingly thankful that Barnabas is in that last category. It took trust and courage to write this book. The road has been hard. And sometimes, as he says, we need to pour out what is boiling in us. When that happens, Pressure is relieved, and people get burned. But Barnabas is not out to burn, not me or any pastor. His aim is healing. That is part of why I wrote this book, he says, to help PKs make sense of, sort through, and express those bottled-up frustrations and pains. Frustrations built up from carrying an anvil-like weight of being the most watched, the most known and the least known people in the church. But boiling over does burn. I have been hard on pastors throughout this book. I have pointed out weaknesses and tendencies and failures. I have prodded and demanded and pushed them to be different, to change, to become aware. My suggestion for the reader is that if it gets too hot in the boiler room, you take a break from the heat and jump in the pool of chapter 8. 
There is a stream of grace that runs through this book. You taste it along the way, but it becomes a pool at the end. A soothing. Barnabas is honest about his own struggles and failures. He has drunk deeply at the fountain of grace. He knows from experience the ultimate solution for all of us. I desire to point to Jesus as the turner of hearts and the lifter of all burdens. Grace, the undeserved favor of God through Jesus, is the source of life and personhood and identity. It is in the freedom of Jesus' overwhelming love that the PK can break out of false expectations and see what it is that makes Jesus happy. As it turns out, when the boiling is over and the burns begin to heal, there is hope for PKs and pastors and churches. It's not all bad news for PKs. Through it all, they have been unwitting and sometimes unwilling apprentices. They have seen, and many have benefited from, the bad and the good. We have seen the pleasures of ministry, helping mend a broken marriage, praying with a heartbroken widow, serving the destitute man who knocks at the door, the close fellowship of a united church staff, or the deep, humbling satisfaction of seeing God use faithful ministry over time to right a sinking ship of a church. Boiling over because of painful experiences may be unavoidable at some point, but Barnabas beckons his fellow PKs not to wallow and bemoan them. Rather, we must own what responsibilities are ours to honor Jesus, to honor our fathers and mothers, to love and support the church, and to go about our lives not as victims, but as the redeemed. Grace is here for all of us. And that includes the sinful and wounded pastors. No man is adequate to be a pastor. That is a job no person is up for, not alone, not without profound grace. And that is the key to all of this, grace. And of course, it is true for the wife and mother, watching with tears the drama play out between her son and husband, or bearing the weight of her daughter's rejection. And finally, there is grace for the church. The church is our family. It's the family that God gave us, so don't give up on it. There isn't a better place out there to be restored. When I received the manuscript of this book and read it, I gave a copy to our 17-year-old daughter. Would you read this? and then talk to me about how I can be a better dad. She did. It was a good talk. It's not over. I suspect she will have ideas about that when she is 30, and I am 80. I hope she will be spared some sorrows because of her big brother's book. Of course, most of that hangs on me, and as we have seen, on grace, which is why I appreciated Barnabas's encouraging conclusion. But now I want to express thanks. I want to say that PKs are blessed to have parents who devote their lives to serving Jesus. So thank you, pastors and spouses. You have given your lives to serving Jesus and His church, and that is a blessing. John Piper Chapter 1. What's wrong with that boy? Oh, so you're a PK. It's a punchline to a joke that doesn't even have to be told. That joke is my life, the life of a pastor's kid. PKs have a reputation. We are notorious troublemakers, rebels, rabble-rousers, and general miscreants. You can even tell we have a reputation because we get our own abbreviation. You don't see a teacher's kid getting called a TK or a salesman's kid getting called an SK. This reputation is justly earned in many cases and goes back a long way. For example, Captain Kidd, the notorious 17th century pirate and Presbyterian minister's son. Just as common as the outright troublemaker, though, is the PK who cares nothing for the faith of his father, who exits the church either in a slow drift or a dead sprint with his middle finger flying high. 
Other PKs might never leave the church, but their staying is rote and habitual rather than committed and passionate. Much has been written about church kids leaving the church and the faith. But these are pastor's kids. They're supposed to be the good ones, the ones who know all the answers, the Bible quiz champions. Gail Hansen, a PK, said, There are expectations that not only are pastors above sin and live holy lives, but their children should be as well. Jeremy Noel, a PK, said, They want the PK to dress like a grandparent and behave like Jesus, but they also seem to wait for the time when the pastor's daughter makes out and the son drinks beer. Do you see the problem developing? Two paragraphs into this chapter and we already have two conflicting stereotypes the derisive expectation of failure, and the legalistic one of perfection. It's not exactly an ideal choice for PKs to make because there is no right answer. Walking away from the faith ends in destruction, while legalistic pursuit of perfection, well, it does too. In the end, it feels as if we're left with an uncomfortable position between a rock and a hard place. Or we can just leave altogether. Normal Kids, Abnormal Life At our hearts, PKs are as normal as people get. We are born with a variety of gifts, inclinations, propensities, and talents, just like all the other kids. Some of us love sports, some love to read, and others love the arts. Some are quiet and some are boisterous. Some of us are lazy and others are studious, just like all the other kids. And just like them, we all have one thing in common. We're sinners. Every PK is born from the same seed of Adam, like every plumber's, banker's, or musician's kid. It's important to state this up front because it's a step towards setting the right expectation. Sinners, sin. No, PKs aren't born different. There isn't some peculiar pastoral DNA we've inherited that messes with our heads and hearts and inclines us to a place of struggle. We're not born any more messed up than anyone else. Neither are we born less messed up, as if some of the assumed pastoral sanctification has rubbed off on us. So why is it that all these PKs, the ones who seemingly have every biblical advantage, struggle to embrace and live in the faith of our fathers? Let me answer that question with another question. Why do pastors go into ministry? I mean the good ones, the ones who love the Bible, have a passion for Jesus, and want to see people come to know Him. What is it that moves them to pursue the life of a pastor, to leave behind the hope of another career, to become a shepherd of a wayward and wily flock? It is a calling, that inescapable pull on the heart and mind that draws him into the pastorate. And it is God who calls, so he follows. He has no other choice and no other desire. And their spouses? When God calls, they respond too. The wife of a pastor is just as called to the ministry as the pastor himself. And in many circumstances, she bears the greater burden. She willingly joins her husband on the mission and sees her place in it. They live this life of ministry hand in hand and going in the same direction. His calling is her calling. Yes, I know there are numerous instances of pastors dragging their spouses into the ministry. That is a separate problem altogether. I am describing those couples who desire to serve the Lord together. But what about their children? Are they old enough to be consulted? Not if they're unborn. Do they have any idea what dad and mom are setting out to do and be? Do they have any clue what this will mean for their lives? Even those kids who are old enough to sign off on the new job for dad have no idea what this will mean for their lives. And those who have yet to be born are hosed. Dad and mom might be following God's call, but these kids are just following dad and mom. What choice do they have? A child doesn't know the call of his pastor father. All he knows is the effects it has on his life. He doesn't feel moved to ministry because he's not. Yes, it is the call of the child to honor his parents, but that is not the same as a call to vocational ministry. The call of the father is not the call of the child, but the ministry of the father creates an anvil-like weight on the child. He just feels the pressure of it. Even the best pastoral parents can't protect their kids from this. And it is this pressure, in part, that drives so many PKs to break. The Pressure Cooker Cooking with a pressure cooker looks exactly like boiling food. It involves a big metal pot with water in it and a stove burner underneath. But it cooks food much faster than standard boiling does. Why is that? Because when water turns into steam and is trapped, it becomes pressurized. 
and the pressurized steam reaches a much higher temperature. So instead of your food cooking at 212 degrees, water's boiling point, it cooks it close to 250 degrees. Not only that, though, the higher temperature and pressure create chemical reactions that can increase the rate of cooking by up to four times. Why am I telling you this? Because being a PK can be very much like living in a pressure cooker. Even though we look just like the other kids and the ingredients are the same, our atmosphere is subtly but massively different. The ministry creates a pressure of expectation that is unlike any other. If all the other kids are cooking at 212 degrees, rather a challenge all its own, we are cooking at a scalding 250 pressurized degrees, and we are reaching our done point that much faster. Criselda Deerham, a PK, said, I certainly felt the pressure to be perfect. The pastoral ministry isn't like other high-profile upbringings. It isn't like politics or Hollywood celebrity. Those both come with their pressures, certainly. But they don't come with the same unattainable expectations that so many PKs feel. A senator's child simply needs to look holy enough to not raise eyebrows. Then she can escape the public eye. From there, all she has to do is not get caught doing anything too stupid. For a PK, there is no choice but to be holy, lest the name of Jesus and the position of daddy be shamed. The job itself requires holiness. Is it getting warm in here, or is it just me? The Realities Thus far, all I have done is recognize the presence of challenges in the PK's life and given some vague illusions as to what they are. As we forge ahead through these chapters, we will explore the realities PKs face. But before we get going, I want to make clear the premise within which I work. PKs face unique obstacles that create an environment that can lead to significant spiritual, identity, and lifestyle challenges. Sometimes these are expressed as outright rebellion, and other times you might barely know they're there because the PK has so mastered the churchy arts as to slip his hypocrisy past the most astute deacon and Sunday school teacher. Sometimes these struggles are so embedded in the souls of PKs that they don't even know if they really believe what they grew up believing. Sometimes they can't diagnose the struggles at all and have no idea they even exist. For me, it wasn't until I hit a massive spiritual crisis in my mid-twenties that I began to recognize the depths of my spiritual identity issues. I was broken first by the weight of sin, then by the weight of grace. Sins that had festered in my heart for decades were exposed and ripped out. It hurt like a little sliver of hell. My false identity that hid so much dishonesty and nastiness was crushed by God's gracious discipline, and I was left with... What? What was I? In the healing and restoring since then, I have seen that much of who I thought I was prior to that came from my father's teaching and the force of his ministry, but it was not my own. I did not own it or feel comfortable in it. And it did not own me or comfort me. I was lost even though I knew every inch of the map. In short, John Piper's Jesus was not Barnabas Piper's. Barnabas Piper did not know the real Jesus. This is not to say I was not saved. It is to say I did not have a relationship with Jesus that was deep, close, personal, and truly life-changing. By God's grace, I have not rejected that teaching or the faith my dad tried to instill in me during my growing up years. Neither, though, have I followed neatly in his footsteps. I have my own opinions, my own thought processes, my own convictions. I'm developing as a man and as a follower of Jesus differently than he did. I have different gifts, hobbies, and convictions about many things. The faith, the reality of Jesus Christ as my only hope, though, is one that I share with my Father. But it took utter breaking at the hand of God over sin in my life to get me there. It was not my identity as a PK that saved me. It was grace. And so it is for all PKs who follow Jesus. As I have spoken with pastor's kids from around the country, I have been amazed by how many have fallen away from Jesus. But I am also amazed by how many live their lives for him with passion and purpose. Both outcomes seem so unlikely, and sometimes they are the same PKs who do both, walk away and then live for Jesus. And so, as we move forward, know that this isn't a book of hopelessness or doomsday soothsaying. 
God's grace is bigger than these struggles. This is a glimpse into the realities PKs live as they are pressure cooked in the ministry of their parents. Our stories are different, our parents are different, our churches are different, but the pressures are largely the same. Our struggles are the same. And so we set off to know those struggles, to seek ways to avoid them, and to find what God would have us learn from them.